Greetings, Sleepy Hollow fans. I'm Jonathan Crook, known for telling the legend of Sleepy Hollow. We're now on a quest to find the varied places and to share the stories of the different ghosts inhabiting Sleepy Hollow and environs. We begin our quest seeking the place where a certain Hessian who gallops about these days got decapitated. Now once during the dark days of the American Revolution, when Hessian soldiers were seen ascending up the Davenport Neck from the Long Island Sound in New Rochelle, folk round there cried, The Hushman! The Hushman! They're coming! Put out your hearth fires! Why? Why? Would they come foraging, them Hushmen? They can't find what they want to eat. They'll eat children. And them Hessians, they've got two rows of teeth. They'll devour the kids right up. And thus, the battle had its stage set in southern Westchester. Some of the Hessians got attacked from behind a stone wall near Mamaroneck. And by the time General William Howe, Commander-in-Chief of the British forces, came nearby here, West Harris in New York, but over in White Plains was he, along with his Hessians. Above the Bronx River, on Chatterton's and Hill all the way to Merritt Hill, Washington assembled his forces. They were farmers, blacksmiths, apothecaries, wheelwrights, young lads, trembling when they looked out across the field where the city of White Plains now stands in the Quaropus, the misty marsh. What did they see? Well, one fellow by the name of Captain Hull said, oh, what grandeur! Look at them in their uniforms, splendid red, and the brass plates on the Heads of them glistening out. Well, how waited. See, he fought rather like a game of chess, and he thought a great show of force would force these rebels to lay down their arms and give up their, their uh, rebellion against their king and their country. Well, the Hessians, they weren't having it. And though they may not have eaten children, they wanted to take their bayonets as they did on Long Island and run them right through those who dare go against the natural order of things to have a king ruling over you. Not mob rule as they were calling for. Thus, the Hessians unleashed their cannons and the balls began to fly up onto Chatterton's Hill. But the Delaware men under the command of a commander by the name of Haslett held their ground until one of those cannonballs tore open the leg of one of those fellas. Seeing the gore, it caused those farmers and blacksmiths to run. Washington and his other generals, Putnam, Spencer, Heath, tried to hold the line. But when the woods around Chatterton's Hill caught on fire, that's when Howe sent in his grenadiers, fellows with great bearskin hats, with those brass plates adorned with skulls and crossbones, and the Americans feared, oh, I don't want them skull and crossbone lads coming upon me. Ah! And off they ran. Washington narrowly effected a retreat to Misery Hill at North Castle. Later that night, Around the 29th, 30th of October, 1776, the second in command of the British, Sir Henry Clinton said, uh, General Howe, how they fight us is the way that we must um, reciprocate. Give them a dose of their own medicine. What are you suggesting? I am suggesting we attack their camps at night and wipe them out once and for all. My Hessian commanders would agree. And Donop and Ral nodded their heads and 
pulled on their pointed mustaches. Well, Howe agreed with Clinton. And, around Halloween, the Redcoats with the Hessians were ready to attack General Washington. But, a godsend just came down. A, a rain star. The powder, wet, prevented an attack. Next morning, however, General Howe sent out an expedition not far from where now I stand, near Silver Lake. Then it was called Horton's Mill. The mill still stands, as will the story. A small contingent of mounted artillerymen, led by a Hessian commander, went seeking Americans, cannon, and supply depots. Now, the American cannon, some were kept under the command of Captain Alexander Hamilton, who did his due diligence to keep the powder dry. Now, when that contingent came galloping up just over yon, a Lieutenant Fenno had obeyed orders. His powder was dry, and no doubt he heated up one of his 12-pound cannonballs until, BOOM! When it got fired, it hurled through the air like a blazing comet or a pumpkin. And when it struck, what? It took off the head of the Hessian artillerymen, and brought down his horse, and scattered the twenty or so with him in that contingent. General William Howe scribed the words of the Hessian losing his head and horse going down. But the words needed not to be scribed on paper with quill. They were now indelibly in the hearts of all who saw that Hessian lose his head. The farmers, the blacksmiths, the wheelwrights round here witnessed that. And when war ended and folk gathered in the varied taverns at Tarrytown and beyond, doubtless they told this tale. And eventually, it found its way to the ears of Washington Irving. And eventually, months after the Hessian fell, round here, the Van Tassel family found the body and brought it headless to the old Dutch church in Sleepy Hollow, begging the Domini, mayest we bury the body here? It was permitted, but headless, fearing this Hessian may not be Christian, it received no marker, but, mark my words, word of the headless Hessian galloping about seeking that missing head, it began to ride in rage, thanks to the good folk who experienced that horror, and to Washington Irving, who put it into his legend of Sleepy Hollow. Today, sense a presence round and about sleepy hollow and environs led by that commander in chief of all powers of the air the galloping headless hessian of sleepy hollow Greetings all, Jonathan Cruck, here in Sleepy Hollow with a warning. Make haste when crossing bridges here, especially before the dawn. A headless horseman may be in pursuit. In the legend of Sleepy Hollow, Washington Irving's classic, he describes the apparition 
of a Hessian trooper galloping about these roads, forever scouring for its head, lost in an aimless battle. Now, some dill makers claim that there's some sinister figure from Queens riding around with a broad axe, lopping off heads, harvesting them to tuck away in some ancient oak tree. In the story, we're left wondering, could it have been Brom Bones disguised as the headless horseman to drive away his rival, schoolmaster Rickabot Crane, who was sweet upon Katrina Van Tassel? Could, however, have been Brom. But just because it was Brom disguised as the ghost doesn't mean that the ghost is not out and about still marauding these parts, seeking out that missing head. Its discontent won't go to the next life without that head. Thus, it fears crossing bridges. The bridge might take it over the river Styx into the next life. What kind of spirit wants to dwell in the afterlife? Decapitated, not our headless horseman. People report to me as the legend of Sleepy Hollow storyteller, sensing the horse mostly, whinnying, snorting, or cantering behind them. If they happen to sense that spirit coming to a bridge, best to keep on going. Turn round and you might suffer the fate that Ichabod did, or worse. Be sure, here in Sleepy Hollow, to go straight over the bridge with haste. Fail to do so, and the headless horseman will... Cut off your head. Take heed here in Sleepy Hollow. Hold on to your heads. Come all ye bold Americans, and unto me give ear, I'll give you now a story, to give your spirits fear and a little bit of haunted history from Sleepy Hollow Patriots Park, where I, Jonathan Cruck, your storyteller, now stand. This is Steve Kelman trying to slip in a little Yankee doodle on us. If you were to come by here early in the morning, Something would slip up behind you. An icy, forlorn spirit. Here's the story why that spirit continues to haunt this place and us. In September the 23rd, 1780, not far from where we now stand, there stood a fellow, fine, courtly, in his stockings. Around him stood three, well, country bumpkins, boss loppers, as they would have been called in the day. And they were debating about what to do with this fellow once they had found in his stockings the plans for West Point. Well, they hoped maybe to get some silver out of him. He kept begging, please, you must not detain me. I have important business. Look, didn't you see the pass I presented to you from General Benedict Arnold? Yes, but when we accosted you, I lifted my musket and I called unto ye, what party are you from? And I, seeing your Hessian coat, said the lower party, believing that you were with the British army, a Hessian fighting for the cause to prevent the rebellion. Yea, but we're loyal patriots. Aren't we, Van Wart? Aren't we, Williams? Yea, that we are. Yea, we are indeed. We're going to bring you in. Then let uh, 
Officer Jameson decide what to do with you. And thus, the three Skinners, Americans looking out for cowboys who stole cows from the farms round here and drove them down to New York City to sell to the British Army. Now they were going to bring this fellow in. He said, my name is John Anderson. I am a merchant. And I will make it worth your while if you were to let me go. And he produced a pocket watch to prove his gentlemanliness and his wealth. But he wasn't able to prove very much more. Major John Andre had met earlier, one evening in the Hudson Highlands, with, ah, who do I have here? It must be the hero of the Siege of Quebec and Montreal, and the Battle of Valcour Island, the one who preserved the American cause after getting troops to escape from that isle, and the esteemed hero of the Battle of Saratoga. I am Major John Andre, a pleasure to meet you. General Benedict Arnold, please, said Arnold in that mountain lair, call me Gustavus. That's when he presented Major John Andre with the plans for West Point and the plan to become a turncoat, a traitor. Andre agreed and expected to escape across the Hudson River to the boat upon which he had traveled north from New York City, the Vulture. But the Vulture had been cannonaded at Croton Point and now was near Dobbs's Ferry. And Andre had to be rowed across the Hudson River by Joshua Het Smith, who insisted, Oh, sir, you've got to take off your, your red coat. Let me put this cloak on ye, and, and I'll put on a hat. You look like a merchant. Well, I'm not to be out of uniform. Well, don't you have a pass from Benedict Arnold? Yea, I do. Well, worry not. I'll take you through the, the no man's land of Westchester. Once we get you down near Dobbs's Ferry, you'll be safe. But Smith, after a night nervous up in Pete Skill, where the two had to sleep head to tail sharing a bed, decided in the morn, oh, oh I'd best go uh, tell uh, uh, Benedict Arnold there's been a change in plan. What? And leave me to my own devices to travel through this, 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 this no man's land? Oh, you'll be fine. Just, just cross the, the, the Croton River, head south. When you get to Dobbs's Ferry, you'll be safe. Follow the, the old post road. And thus, Major John Andre, disguised as Merchant John Anderson, traveled. He stopped by a little farmhouse where children gave him a peach. That was the last act of real kindness he was able to succor. He traveled down and early in the morning of September the 23rd, came upon that fellow just up off of the old post road here, Paulding with his musket and Hessian's coat. What party are you from? He cried. And when Andre said, the lower party, Paulding, Van Wart and William stripped him and found the plans. And then, though Andre begged in a letter to be exchanged as a prisoner of war to General George Washington. Washington responded by arranging a trial. He declared he didn't want it to be the way the British had treated Nathan Hale, hanging that American patriot after a summary judgment. The noose went round his neck. No, Washington had 14 generals and the likes of the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexander Hamilton to watch over the prisoner and the proceedings. Andre was kept across the river in what was then called the Maybe House in Tapan, New York. And all who met him agreed he was a gentleman and he had been duped by Benedict Arnold. Why, not only did Hamilton and the Marquis de Lafayette begged for mercy for Andre, but so too did Washington's own spy master, Major Benjamin Talmadge. But the generals agreed. 
And in the trial, it was determined that Major John Andre, out of uniform, a British officer, proceeding through what for him would be enemy territory, was on a mission of espionage, proceeding to deliver the plans for the American fortress West Point and to facilitate the traitorous conduct of Benedict Arnold. Thus, Andre was sentenced to be hanged, and on October the 2nd, he was brought out to Old Tapan, New Jersey, with officers escorting him. He first went over to Talmadge and others and said, thank you for the kind treatment that you have given me. You've been most gentlemanly, causing Talmadge most there to begin to weep. It so moved Dr. Thatcher, who was on the scene, he wrote in his journal, the ground was consecrated with tears, cried for the British officer, the spy, Major John Andre. Andre took the noose himself and put it round his neck and then announced, let all who witness the occasion of my death See that I meet my fate, a brave man. Then Colonel Scammell brought down his sword and the executioner hit the horse that pulled the cart out from beneath the feet of the scarlet-coated officer. The last words he heard were, Free Major Andre! Hang Benedict Arnold! Hang Benedict Arnold! Free the man! Andre was free from the mortal coil of this life. He was buried on that spot in Old Japan, New Jersey. Years later, when they dug up the body, that peach, the pit he had kept in his pocket, had grown right through his skull. But where is the spirit of Andre? Not in Old Japan. But here, early in the mornings, people continue to report, sensing, even amidst the noise and the haste, on Route 9 there, hearing and feeling the presence of Andre's ghost sneaking behind them, moaning, Why did they hang me and not Benedict Arnold? Sometimes, It'll clap its icy, bony hand upon your body. To ward off that spirit, to be sure it doesn't grab you, here's what you do. When you sense that spirit, perhaps even hearing its moan, why did they hang me and not Benedict Arnold? You is the words that, that Andre, used. Yell out, I'm from the lower party, and the ghost will be warded off. Fail to say, I'm from the lower party, and you'll hear far more frightful sounds than rumbling trucks. You'll hear Andre's spirit. Giving the shrieks, twas too brave to give. At the gallows, you'll hear the spirit say, Why did they hang me and not Benedict Arnold? My friends, this is the story, a touch of haunted history from Sleepy Hollow at Patriot's Park. I'm Jonathan Krupp, Steve Strumming Kelm. Thank you very much. Jonathan Krupp, here at the homestead of the first American to become famous, to have his works go viral. Not talking about these COVID times, but I'm talking about times when people wanted to know what were these Americans like? And it took Washington Irving to show the world through his 
sketchbook of stories, including The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Once those stories got out into the world, it made a world of difference to Washington Irving. He became the first American to become not only famous as an author, but relatively wealthy. It enabled him to buy this old, one, what once was a Dutch farmhouse, and convert it into this, um, as he called it, a snuggery. Originally, it was Wolfert's Roost, or Wolfert's um, Rest, or Rust, as it was often called. But now, it's known as Sunnyside, open for outdoor tours, and you can get a sense for how Washington Irving came to deeply appreciate the majestic, mysterious Hudson River, not only in his stories, but in where he then chose to live. Here with you at Sunnyside, Washington Irving's homestead, to share a ghostly tale, a tale found in the most famous of all ghostly tales, indeed, the most famous story of all short stories written by an American, and that is The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I have to state, my heart's a bit broken, for traditionally, I would be on this Saturday in the old Dutch church built in 1685, telling the whole legend of Sleepy Hollow. That's where I tell the tale. But here, now, you'll listen to one of the stories to frighten not just Ichabod Crane, but many who still live around here and know of the ghost in this story. The tale is called The Wailing Woman in White. Once during the dark days of the American Revolution, when George Washington and his men fled from White Plains and began to look for places here in Westchester County to hide from the Redcoats, a couple of those Redcoats, bump, 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 knocked on a farmhouse door not far from where we now sit. It was a tiny cottage. The Major, the older of the two, said, Lieutenant, here is how it's done. And he lifted the latch of the door, uh, opened it, and walked right into the house. And then they stomped the mud and the manure from their boots, and the Major called out, By the powers granted to us, by His Majesty, King George III, we, your protectors, will be served. Serve us and serve your king. Now, come out from hiding. Who is about? About in the house, behind a barrel of flour, hid a young woman. I believe her name was Priscilla. She stepped out. She knew what the consequences could be if she had tried to run out. Forgive me, sir, she said, nodding her fingers and brushing her petticoat. But I'm much afeard of the two of ye. You've nothing to fear, we're your protectors. It's that Mr. George Washington and his rebel horde you should fear now. Serve us and serve your king. Remove our boots. Do you have any um, victuals, things to eat? She said, very little. And then the major sat down and she pulled off his boots. And the mud and the manure got on her hands. The lieutenant watched and thought, she has fine hands for a farm girl. And thus, he decided to go out to take off his boots and not dirty the place. And when he did, it was the first act of kindness between the British lieutenant and the American farm lass. Now, the way the commander of these two officers fought was like a game of chess. General Howe would move his army and wait for George Washington to surrender. Washington didn't. 
and in the time, how could have a sip of wine or play another game of chess? Now this gave Priscilla and the lieutenant a chance to get to know one another, and often they were seen walking right over yon along the banks of the Hudson River in a conversation. Sometimes, up at Odell's Tavern, just along the post road here, people talked about them. Oh, said the blacksmith, I saw that Priscilla. She was walking, holding hands with that British lieutenant. I tell ye, no good will come from it, her having a fancy for him. The alewife in the tavern replied, holding hands? Ha! Ah, I saw the two of them. <laughs> Kissing. And on it went. And then one day, a messenger came. Lieutenant Major, you have orders to report to Dobbs's ferry to chase after General Washington and his army across Hudson's River. Sirs, well, there you have it, Lieutenant. We have our orders. And why don't you bid farewell to your, um, your American wench and um, give her a kiss from me? The lieutenant then cried, Priscilla, come with me. And he took her from the farm around here, high to a place known as Raven Rock. And in those days when you stood on this huge outcrop, you could spy the Hudson River. Yeah. When they did, the major got down on bended knee and said, Priscilla, will you marry me? In two months' time, I will leave the army, and I will come sailing up Hudson's River. When you see the white sail of my boat sail into Tarry Town, come and meet me. And from here, in exactly two months at this spot at Raven Rock, you'll be able to see my boat. What say ye, my darling? She said, oh, I love you. I will come here and watch for your boat. And when I see it, I'll get to Tarry Town. And we can marry in New York City and leave this war-torn land. And they believed by their love to be protected. But it said that the path to true love never runs straight. Well, in those two months, Priscilla gathered up white scraps of cloth, hard to find in these days of the American Revolution, and she sewed them together to make a white wedding dress. The blacksmith, the alewife, would say, oh, he ain't gonna come for you. He's already stolen some kisses. That's all he wants. And if he does come, Priscilla, maybe he'll bring you to New York City and kiss you and break your heart. No, my love is true, she insisted. But when the two months passed, Priscilla went high atop the eerie outcrop of Raven Rock. And looking down, she could see the Tappan Zee. But instead of see seeing a sailing ship with a white flag up top, she saw the first storm of winter moaning and rolling in with wind and snow and cold. The snow began to fill all around and she walked around on the rock, looking out on the Hudson. If she thought she saw the white flag on the top of the boat, she'd call, my beloved, is that you? Are you coming for me? She called time and time again, but she mostly called, not to a white flag, but to white caps, white waves, in the stormy Hudson River. She walked until the snow fell to her ankles and made her knuckles crack with cold. She walked about and called, My beloved, is that you? Are you coming for me? The snow gathered up to her calves and then she slugged until it was up to her knees. But still she called, though her eyes grew bloodshot and her voice rasped. My beloved, are you coming for me? But only more.
nor snow and cold came for Priscilla. And then morning came. Now it was the time of war, the revolution. No one could run around wondering, oh, what happened to Priscilla? She was gone. And many people in Westchester County during the American Revolution, oh, they fled from the red coats and the blue coats, the cowboys, the skinners, and spies. It was a war-torn town. But then springtime came. And a couple of hunters had gone up near Raven Rock maybe looking to get a rabbit to put into their stew pot, and, oh, looky there! They saw something in the melting snow, something frightful, decaying. They ran down to the old Dutch church, the very one where the headless horseman rides out, scouring for his missing head. They went to the Domini, the leader of the church, and cried, Domini, there's something up near Raven Rock. Come with us, see it, bring your good book. Well, the Domini, the leader of the church then, gathered up the good book and followed the huntsman. When they came near Raven Rock, he said, By holy God, pray tell what's there. When he looked, he said, Upon it, look, those cheeks which now hang from the bone were once flushed with love, and those blistered lips oozing once spoke of love, and those eyes distending from the skull were only in the fall filled with love. Don't you see? This is Priscilla. She must have come here looking for her beloved, watching for him. But she froze to her death in the storm. Come, gather up the body, and let her wedding dress become her funeral gown. They gathered up the body, and brought it down to the old Dutch churchyard, and put it to rest. And though the body rested, the spirit does not rest. By the spells of Sleepy Hollow, it rises up, especially before storms. And that spirit pervades about these holy hills here, calling out for her beloved. My beloved! You'll hear the voice waxing and waning in the wind. My beloved! Wilt thou come for me? It continues to implore even unto this day. Listen for it. Don't do what you'll do in a moment. When you hear her spirit call, when you hear the wailing woman in white implore, My beloved, will you come to me? Did you jump? Indeed, when you jump, it means you know that that is one of the many ghosts still inhabiting Sleepy Hollow. Thank you very much for listening to the Wailing Woman in White and for jumping. Thank you. Thank you. Well, greetings all, I'm Jonathan Kruk, here with a remedy for these viral times. 
the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Virtually. I've arranged with the old Dutch church to perform there with live music on Halloween. You can find out about the big event by visiting my Facebook page, Jonathan Crux Storyteller Sleepy Hollow. I'm also doing events for groups there, schools, parks, libraries, corporations. Again, the atmospheric of the very setting of Washington Irving's classic, no better place than the old Dutch church. I'll be there to engage all with a dramatic solo show of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. You can get information by emailing me, Jonathan Kruk, K R U K, at gmail.com. So hold on to your heads with the legend of Sleepy Hollow virtually through these COVID times. You know, uh, the great Civil War general and uh, president, Ulysses S. Grant, once remarked that he only knew two songs. The first was Yankee Doodle, and the other one wasn't. And my name is Steve Kelman. I never served in the Civil War, although some people think I'm that old. Well, I do perform farmer's markets, small cafes, uh, throughout the Hudson Valley region and northern New Jersey, where I'm based. Um, I even performed recently at my hometown diner, where I've been going probably since the Civil War. Uh, no, they weren't there. Uh, but I've been going there for quite a while, and they just had me perform uh, with my bass player, uh, Chuck, and we uh, were asked to come back next week, so we did real well. <laughs> and uh, you can actually contact me if you want more of this. Uh, uh, at my email address and also on Facebook. I also play guitar. Uh, again, my name is Steve Kelman. Thank you for your time. <laughs>